if you are a U.S. citizen, you are operating under public policy. Now, a lot of us think that public policy is the same thing as public law. We haven't had any laws at all since 1933. So what we have is we have a policy that you're operating under by consent. So with every policy that they, they try to pass, or they do pass, they call it an act. Now, if you've ever been to a play at school for your children, they're in a play and it's an act, okay? And so you can tell that they're acting because they, they have on costumes. And so when they passed the Department of Motor Vehicles Act, they made sure that you knew that you were participating in an act and it wasn't real, okay? That's why they dressed up all the actors. We have costumes on the Highway Patrol. We have costumes on the Sheriff Department. We have costumes on the judge when you get there. You're participating in a suit when you get to court. Suit comes from the word suit. <laughs> this guy is in a suit right now, and so the attorneys wear suits. That's their, that's their costume. And you show up, and you're supposed to dress just like a citizen. And most of you tonight are dressed like citizens. <laughs> that's how we dress when we're citizens. So what I'm, I'm saying all that for, if, if that makes sense, is that <clears throat> if those were all laws... Um, there would only be 10 of them there. Do you remember the guy, the Joker, in that movie? And the guy says, how many guys, how many of your friends did I hurt? And he goes, five. And he goes, five. So there's only 10 laws, okay? The rest of them are called statutes or codes and they all fall under acts. Now here's the good news. <clears throat> I said all that to say this. In every act, in every statute, in every code, there's a remedy. And the remedy is not there for citizens. It's only there for the real man, okay? Now when I say the real man, that, that's who you think you are, okay? The flesh and blood. There's always remedy. There's remedy everywhere. I can't believe how many times I've heard in the last couple of weeks uh, someone call me and say, um, I'm going to court for a dog barking ticket. And I'm going to do this. What do you think? Sounds good. Try it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, all these acts, you're, you're participating in them by consent. And one of the things that I'd like to talk about maybe the next time we come is the Pledge of Allegiance. The other consent that we have is when you gave up title to your car. You turned it into a vehicle and you entered it into the play. And so now you're no longer a traveler, you are a driver or you're an operator. And travelers don't get tickets. They can't. There's no law against traveling, even at the speed of sound. There's no law, I guarantee you. There's also no law for a traveler to carry a license. There's only licenses for operators and drivers. So if you understand all that stuff so far, I'm going to show you how this all started because it's kind of like uh, building a house. When you come up to a really nice house that's already built, you just get to notice how big it is. The, you can't break in. It's got an alarm system. You've got all these things going on with this house. The water, you don't see where the water line comes in. You don't see where the sewer goes out. It's all hid. And so that's where we come in. We come in, we're born into this, uh, I want to call this onto this land. And pretty soon they've got us believing that we have to participate in the play. And so we see our government already structured this huge thing. And we don't see all the sewer going in and the water coming out. <laughs> I said that right. <laughs> we don't see the money going into the pipes. And we don't see the money going out of the pipes. Okay? We don't get to see any of that. 
But if you go back and see pictures of how the house was being built, you can see the backhoe out there on a piece of dirt grading off the weeds. And if you're a contractor, I like talking in those kind of terms because I, I, I build. I, I, run, I run equipment. I put in pipes. I've dropped in sewer lines, leach lines. I've, I've done all that stuff. And so as you get going, you forget. You're, you're standing there and you go, wow, oh, I'm standing on the septic tank right about here. Houses that I built, you go back later and you go, do you remember uh, all the water lines had to go around that big rock that we found while we were trying to... So what I'm saying is we're going to go back in time with history on some of this documentation from the District of Columbia and to see how it's, how it's all transpired. Okay. Now, can you zip it up a little bit higher? Okay, the initial review of the District of Columbia. Now, this is called an organic act. Now, I don't know, uh, organic is the same thing as charter. Uh, and, and they hide words behind other words that have the same meaning so that you'll think organic means fresh. Okay? <laughs> 1871. It seems like it only sets up a local government like a Chicago or a Seattle. How do you get that, that they formed a private corporation? Okay, raise it up a little bit. If you take the act out of this historical context, from the present looking at the past, imagine who the parties involved are. We might agree, however, we cannot do that. To best understand what really happened, we have to follow a couple of principles. And the first one is, is you have to know who you are before you can understand anything else around you, okay? If you think, um, that you're a, a wolf cub out in the forest, okay, and you're freezing to death, and you find out later that you're a man and you can make fire, everything around you changes. So we've got to understand who you are first to understand this stuff. Okay, God created you to be the king on your land. The word is called sovereign. That means so over reigns. You're driving the horse. You've got a hold of the reins. That's what so over reigns sovereign means, okay? So, <clears throat> we'll raise it up a little bit more. <clears throat> um, always know that yourself first. Discover the true nature of all the other parties second. Okay, all that you can pass up because it gets a little too deep right there. So right there where it says thus. Uh, to understand the parties involved in the District of uh, Columbia Organic Act of 1871. Think about that. That was only 140 years ago. Okay, two generations. That's it. So we're not that far back. Although they didn't have planes and cars and all that stuff there, most of the people in, in, in that time era were biblical, okay? They had a Bible and they had a law book, okay? They knew the law, and those are the two books that they had on their hearth of their fireplace. And instead of going home and watching TV or going down to the gym or whatever they did, whatever we do now, bridge club, um, I... NASCAR races. I mean, you got to understand that the de facto has put everything in front of us to keep us distracted. I mean, every sport you can think of is on TV. We're, when I was a, when I was a kid, we had I think 13 channels, maybe 12 because channel one wasn't a channel, but we only had uh, 12 channels. And if there wasn't something on TV that we liked, that thing was off most of the time. We were out playing. I mean, I didn't have video games, and our children don't have the same. Thing that's going on and if you look at the underlying of what all's going on with that they're using all of that to keep us beat down to keep us tired and keep us working and so that we don't go on the internet and read the district of columbia act from 1871 so anyway um we're i'm going to go down about the third sentence we're not going to get into this act entirely suffice to say looking over the situations we find that the act is one made by the original jurisdiction congress so this was made by the original Congress, okay, the good Congress. Right out of the Civil War, it started being a little more, uh, the, the Congress was a little corrupt because the South walked out, and so they appointed people at gunpoint to come in and pass this stuff. But nevertheless, uh, they were still operating as a de jure type of government, okay? Okay. Actually, comment. There's also inside that document. You're not going to read it, but there's a limitation as to the amount of land that the federal government can set aside for 
We're, we're going to get into that. Yeah. <laughs> really good. That's okay. Now, there's a guy that studied history. Let's give him an applause. I'm serious. Okay, the District of Columbia was originally provided for in the Constitution for the United States. That's the original one from 1787 at Article 1, Section 8, specifically in the last two clauses on July 16th and 1790. So a good thing that was put aside by our congressmen or by our forefathers was corrupted by some, some people that had uh, other agenda in them, okay, in their pocket. Um, <clears throat> the territory included the actual government. Under the act, Congress also made the president the civic leader of the local government in all matters in that territory. So the president was the civil leader, civic leader. You see how that, he, he wasn't even the president. Now, if I were to change the name of the District of Columbia to the District of Mexico, and we allowed Mexico to build a 10 square mile uh, capital area in the middle of Oklahoma, okay? And we said you guys could stay there and you could pass all the laws that you want. I've got to say Oklahoma because that would, that would be right in the middle of the heart of our country, okay? Now right in the middle of the heart of our country back then, was Washington DC so but if we let Mexico set up a little spot there and we told them they could hire a little president and they could do their own little thing but they only had jurisdiction over that 10 square miles what would we care would you care would anybody care I mean that they had to stay to their self okay any laws that they passed was only for the citizens of that area and their employees okay go ahead isn't that what an embassy is isn't that like that is a foreign corporate uh, foreign jurisdiction in our country is not what Real it's close. That's okay. kind of how this got started. Okay, okay. Uh, let's raise it up just a little higher. On uh, February 27, 1801, under the Second District of Columbia Act, two countries were formed and the respective officers and district judges were appointed. Further, the established town, raise it up some more, uh, governments of Alexandria, Georgetown, and Washington were recognized as constituted and placed under the laws of the district its judges, etc. So the United States Supreme Court has re repeatedly called this act the District of Columbia Organization Act. So they're an organization. Okay? Or the uh, Charter Act of the District of Columbia. Now, if you look up the word charter... Okay, okay I'm going to yell this out. Charter is a document issued by a sovereign or state outlining the conditions under which a business, city, or other corporate body is organized and defining its rights and privileges. Okay, so the District of Columbia got its privileges from the sovereign. Okay, that's you and me. We are the descendants of the sovereign. So we are sovereigns. Okay? Um, according to the United States Supreme Court, uh, the Charter Acts, first acts, were the official incorporation of the formal government of the District of Columbia. Now, I want you to notice that. That um, the official incorporation of a formal government, not the United States of America. It doesn't say America. It says the government of the District of Columbia as chartered by Congress in accord with the Constitution's privileges or provisions. So what they did is they took something good and they sub, subbed it out. We don't want to mess with this, we're going to let them do it, okay? Are you guys following this so far? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Again, the Supreme Court called that the body of government a corporation with the right to sue and be sued. Now that's good news for you and me. They have the right to be sued. We have the right to sue them. Now here's something really great if you've been studying 1215.org, that we, the sovereign, can change our mind. It's kind of almost like a wife. I'm not saying that in a bad way. How many men have ever got mad at their wife because they changed their mind? Maybe when you first got married, but after a while you don't get mad. It's just part of the deal. Normal. I'm going to wear this. And then they come back out and they got on something. You go, did you change? Yeah, I didn't feel comfortable with that. Well, 
That's how we are as a sovereign, okay? We can agree to a driver's license, and then we can say, you know what, I don't want the driver's license anymore. That's what sovereign is all about. There's a great uh, case with the Indian tribe being sovereign, changing their mind. And the corporation sued them, and the, and, and the Supreme Court said, sorry, they're sovereign, they can change their mind. So there's some more hope for us about, about changing our mind. Oh, 1215.org, okay. This guy right here has got a great website. If you go to 1215.org, 1215 stands for the uh, Magna Carta. That's when it was signed, okay? Um, that was one of the first um, documents that uh, was signed to help the slaves get out of bondage, basically. It wasn't a great document because they, they hid a lot of the truth in that. That sets the basics for the first rule of our standard for review, know the parties. What we have presented is sufficient to show that the basics of who the parties are and related to resolving the answer. We admonish everyone to prove the facts or, or search themselves. The second rule, down here in that last paragraph, the rule from our, our standard review is when you understand the environmental nature of the relationship. With that in mind, let's consider the events of the time. The Civil War had recently ended, and the country was still under Lincoln's Conscription Act. We call that a martial law now. Okay, so under martial law, president can write anything, and it's considered as law. Okay? Now, once we come out of martial law, all those laws are abated. That means they're no longer in effect. Okay? So, if you notice, every president since then has declared war on something. Declared war on drugs. We've declared war on poverty. We've declared, they've, they've all declared war on something to keep us into a state of war. So that the president has ultimate power in our country. Okay? Uh, Congress had at least three problems they could see no way to directly cure by following the laws of the land. They were out of funds. They had uh, promised 40 acres of land to each slave that left the South to fight for the North, and they had to reintegrate uh, the South into the Union, which they could not do without controlling the appointment of the Southern states and congressional me uh, members. There were other problems, but these three stand out from all the rest. That is enough about the environment for the purposes of this review. However, the more you study the historical events of this time, uh, the more obvious the relationships become. You will become a more proof, uh, I'm sorry, it'll become, and the more proof you will have to amass to prove the facts, what, what actually happened. In the interest of time and space, in this response, we'll move on. Okay, the next one up. Knowing the government of District of Columbia was already created into the government, and so formed into a municipal incorporation in 1801, under the District of Columbia Acts, we wonder, even with Congress's con constitutional authority to pass any law within the 10 square mile of the district, how do you create or incorporate for the first time a municipal government that has already been in existence as a municipal corporation for 70 years? And the answer is, it's impossible. So what Congress did is they committed fraud. Okay. Now, the cool part is, is the District of Columbia only has authority over the District of Columbia, okay? And its jurisdictions. How do they get jurisdiction? By consent. Only by our consent. So they call things, instead of the Arizona State, they change the, the terminology to the State of Arizona. It's kind of like being in a state of euphoria. Are we in a euphoria now? We're not in the State of Arizona either, okay? We're on the Arizona Republic, or we're on the Arizona State, whatever you want to say, but we're on. Whenever you're in something, you're under the dirt. You're dead. You're a corporation. So I'm saying all these things to you because when you go to court and the judge asks you, where do you live, and you use the word in, you're done. I'm telling you. He's looking for contracts. He's looking for something that you signed. Do you have a driver's license? You say yes, you're done. He's looking for three contracts of three specific pieces of information to, to trap you into his jurisdiction, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you this. People call and they say, what is the Republic doing? Well, the Republic, for one thing, we're, we're educating as fast as... If I'm in a, in, a, in a bank line trying to cash a check, 
and somebody says, boy, is this economy crooked? I go, we're standing in the biggest bank robbers of all time, right here. He goes, where? I go, right here. They're on the other side. <laughs> They're robbing us every time we get here. And I talk about it all the time because you never know who you're going to run into that is looking for what we're doing. And I got to tell you right now, the season is perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is perfect right now. I don't have anybody say, oh yeah, that George Bush, he was great. Or that Jimmy Carter, boy, what a great guy. Everybody's just sick of everything. You know what I mean? The lights are turning on. So <clears throat> I'm going to get into the three contracts with you real quick so you understand some of that stuff. Um, when you consider the historical facts, the only meaning left for the terms given in the opening paragraph of the District of Columbia Organ, uh, Organic Act of 1871, and that which follows, is that it's a municipal corporation that was created is, I'm sorry, that was created is a private corporation owned by the actual government. And it's saying the government, but it's not saying our government. So what government owns it? The only government created in that act was the same government any private corporation has within operation of its own corporate constru construct. Thus we call it a corporation U.S. Now with any corporation, there's investors, okay, there's a board of directors, there's a secretary, and there's a treasury. Now, the good part is, that all sounds, when I first started hearing this stuff, it was very depressing because I thought, man, we're locked in. The good news is we're sovereign. We can change our mind. You can go back and nullify contracts. You can, if, let me explain one, one quick thing about contracts, okay? How do you cancel a contract? Go ahead. Bankruptcy. <laughs> When you're a dead person, that's the, about the only way you can. But if you're in honor and there's a contract, I have an agreement with him to take out his trash every Saturday, okay? And I sign it or I don't sign it, it doesn't matter. There's a trust there that I'm going to take out his trash every Saturday. After about 10 years of it, I go, golly, I can't even leave on the weekends. <laughs> so I say, okay, I'm going to amend our agreement. That's what amendments are for. So I let him know, hey, Brad. For 10 years, I've taken out the trash for you, and I, I need to leave on the weekend. So what I want to do is I want to amend our agreement. I want you to take out your own trash for the next 10 years, and if you have a problem with that, you have to let me know in 21 days. If you don't respond, I'm going to accept your response as no response as agreement. And if you get mad at me, okay, and you cuss at me because you didn't respond properly, it's a dollar per cussing. <laughs> and this is a self-executing contract. So if you say you don't get it, too bad, I know you got it because I'm going to have Bob Jones, the next door neighbor, hand deliver it to you and he's going to testify that you got it. And by the way, I want you to respond to Bob Jones, the next door neighbor, because if he says you didn't respond, this contract is in full effect. That's how you amend or you cancel a contract. So if we're in honor, there's no fighting. We accept all the terms of the conditions right up to the point where we amend the contract. Is it possible to amend the District of Columbia's contracts? Oh, yeah. Absolutely, okay. Now if I wanted to pull a, tr a tricky one to Brad in the contract, okay, I could say, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and give you $50,000 to let me out of this contract, but I put it in square brackets. I'm going to give you $50,000 to let me out of the contract, and I put it in square brackets. Now, there's some guys here that understand contract law. What do the square brackets mean to that contract of that statement? That's not a part of the contract. That's not there. Okay. So he could say, hey, you said you're going to give me $50,000. Where is it? I go, that's not part of the contract. <laughs> gotcha. Now, if he doesn't understand that, it's buyer beware. Too bad for you. Can you pull up the, um, the, the Constitution? When I started listening to Winston Shroud, I, I did not understand it. But I knew that people in life were where they got to be was from listening to Winston Shroud. I forced myself to watch him. It was like eating broccoli that had been dipped in horse manure. I mean, it was hard. Okay. It was extremely hard. I could not fathom what he was talking about. And he would go so fast, and he seemed like a nice guy. He's got white hair. He said he was a framer. 
I mean, he said he had a couple of jobs, and the guys that I was beginning to run around with kept saying, you need to watch Winston Shroud. Choked him down, night after night. Sometimes I'd watch the same 15-minute segment of the video a hundred times, and so I could understand a little bit. At least I could recite. It was kind of like learning a song, you know? You sing it over a hundred times, you can, you can say it, even if you don't know what you're saying. You can understand it. And he said, square brackets, a lot of the stuff in the uh, Constitution doesn't pertain to us, doesn't pertain to citizens. Now that's, I knew this because I was a Chief Justice for a little while, and I knew that the Supreme Court had ruled that when people come in and say, I demand my constitutional rights, they, the judge says, sit down and shut up. If you say that again, I'm going to throw you in jail. And what the reason why is because the Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution, that the citizens are not a party to it. How could that be? It talks about the 14th Amendment and the slaves. They're a part of it. We're all a part of it. That's our Constitution to keep the government below us. Well, let me show you what I found. Article 1. You see how that's written? In the original Constitution, that's how it's written. Let's slide up about... Um, Let's go to the 13th or 14th Amendment. It talks about the people a lot. Now this is just a, an observation that I made. There's three, four, oh, back. Has anybody seen any square boxes? The rights of the citizens of the United States. That isn't a part of the contract. It's on there, but citizens don't have rights. It's like jumbo shrimp. Has anybody seen a shrimp this big? There are no jumbo shrimp. There's a little bit bigger ones than the bigger ones, but they're all shrimp. Okay, they're all small. That, that article right there, 2026, 20, is not part of the Constitution. Now, if you look at the Constitution of the United States, because there's two of them, the opposite brackets are on those ones, okay? So if you're a citizen, you got to read the second one. And if you're a sovereign, you need to read the first one. That's all there is to it. Now, I've got one more quick thing to tell you. What? Could you explain the four corners? The four corners rule? Just a quick thing to have some fun. The next time you get a ticket, if the highway patrolman pulls you over, be real nice. Hand him your license and tell him that's your, your corporation license. Okay, that's my corporate traveling pass. Have some fun with it, okay? Be nice to the guy. But when you sign your name in the ticket, put a square box around the signature area and make sure it's all locked in. So that it's, and then sign in that box and hand it back to him. Okay? If you guys know what A for V is, go ahead and get that on there too. All right? Now, when you hand that to him, if it gets back to the court, there's no signature on it. Okay? You guys... If you know how to defend that, it's a lot of fun. Okay, I'm just telling you that's one way to do it.